Let's take some time to come before the Lord. Prepare our hearts for worship. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, I... 
Lord Jesus, we just thank you, Lord. You're worthy to be praised. Lord, thank you for showing us your love and grace on the cross, Lord. Worship the Lord's goodness today. He's so, so good. Amen. Come on, let's sing this together. Amazing love that welcomes me. The kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving God you're so good God you're so good oh God you're so good you're so church we lift it up today come on sing this with me we sing God you're so good come on oh God
life know that God is working for good so come on can we sing that one more time in faith we sing God you're so good God you're so good oh God you're so good you're so Powerful and surrender. So come on, let's lift it up. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all. I stand my soul, Lord, to you surrender.
So in both cases, when you speak to this person, he'll never say that he was able to get away from the shark because of how great he swam or how good of a water skiing he, he, he was, a water skier. It was because of God allowing him the grace to survive the shark attacks. And, and that person is John, by the way. John is the only person I know that has survived two separate shark attacks. Amen? <laughs> so we nicknamed John Shark Bait, just so you know. So whenever we hang out with him, we had a room with his name on it at Lake Champion. It had shark bait on the bottom. So whenever we go to the water or the ocean, if John goes into the water, everybody comes out because they think there's a shark nearby to attack. Amen. But you never, you always give God credit for what, he always gives God credit for what God does. Amen. It was, it's not our abilities or our skill. The word God is usually replaced with the word I. We see it in many circumstances in the Bible. We're meant to credit for something that God did. If you turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 24, 2 Samuel chapter 24, we're going to read about David and his, and his army. Amen? This is after David had fallen with Bathsheba. It's after he got recovered at, or, rest, or restored. And now later on in David's life, about five chapters later, we find this situation. So the king said to David, 2 Samuel chapter 24, verses 2 through 4 and 8 through 9, it says, So the king said, to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him. Roam about now through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and conduct a census for the people, so that I may know the number of the people. But Joab said to the king, May the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as there are, while the eyes of the Lord can still see. But why does my lord the king delight in this thing? Nevertheless, the king's orders prevailed against Joab, and against the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army left the presence of the king to conduct the census throughout all of Israel. Verse 8 says, So when they had roamed about through the whole land, they came to Jerusalem, and at the end of nine months, 
and 20 days. And Joab gave the numbers of the census to the king, which is David. In Israel, there were 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword. And men of Judah were 500,000. Amen? So let's do the math here. David had 1.3 million military men, active military men. Amen? Worldpopulationview.com says that China today has 2 million people um, registered in its army, active fighting men, not paramilitary or people that work in office, people that are able to fight. Amen? 2 million today. India has 1.4 million. The United States has 1.3 million. These are the largest armies in the world. When we compare it to the total population of the world, David's army was probably the largest percentage-wise that ever existed in all of mankind. With the world population of only 115 million in David's time, his army was 10% of the population of the entire world. He had 10% of his army was the amount of people in the entire world. When you compare that to China's military today, which is the largest, they only have 0.27% of the population of the entire world. So this was an extensive, massive army that David had. The fact that David only counted fighting men is evidence that David was trying to demonstrate that he had a great army and that he was almost invincible. In other words, David was saying, look at the great army I have put together. Look at my success and accomplishments. Joab's warming to David is a classic, and it tells David, and I'm paraphrasing, why do you need to count the men? Isn't God able to increase the size of the army to, to meet any challenge that we could face? Joab knew that whatever the size of the threat against Israel was, God had always given them enough men to win the battle. God had always given them enough men to win the battle. This is one example of how man can take credit for something that God has done. One example. Another example can be found in Daniel chapter 4, verses 30 and 33. Daniel chapter 4, verses 33, you all know the story of King Nebuchadnezzar. The king began speaking and was saying, Is this not Babylon the great, which I myself had built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for my, the honor of my majesty? While the word of, was still in the king's mouth, the voice from heaven came saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you, and you will be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the animals of the field. You will be given to the grass to eat. You'll become like an animal in the field eating grass, it says. And as you know the story, King Nebuchadnezzar became like a beast living in, in the field. And he lost what he had because he failed to give glory to God for something that God had done. It was God who had given King Nebuchadnezzar the ability to amass what he had. It is God that gives us the ability to work and wake up in the morning and to breathe and to walk and to talk and to understand and to comprehend and to retain information and to share information. It is God. He is the source of everything that we can do. He is the source of our ability to see, of our ability to smell, of our ability to taste, of our ability to do everything and touch and feel. He gives us that ability. But too many times we get used to us doing it, so we take credit for it. Sort of like David and Nebuchadnezzar did. The danger of doing that is that we actually believe ourselves, and when the time comes to ask God for something, we think that because we're unable to do it, that he can't do it either. Amen? Because we think that because we can't do it, he can't do it. So we place human limitations on an omnipotent God. If we think we get so used to us doing something, so used to being self-sufficient, that when we ask God to do something great, we think that because we're limited in our ability to do it, we think that he is incapable of doing it. So we put our standards on God's standards. In Matthew 19, we find this example. Matthew chapter 19, verse 23, and it reads, And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were very astonished. They said, then who can be saved? Here the disciples are thinking about their own limitations and their inability of putting a camel through the eye of a needle. Amen? They're thinking, how impossible is this? We can't do that. So then how can a person be saved if it's that hard? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, with man... This is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. God didn't say some things. God didn't say a few things. God didn't say maybes. God said all things. 
Every single thing is impossible with God. For me, when doubt comes in, in, in I rely on the testimonies of what God has done for me in my past and what God continues to do today to encourage and guide me. If you turn to me to Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1 is a clear example of God's power, excuse me, of what he can do and how he can, and the, the amazing capabilities that, that God has. God is just so powerful. And Genesis chapter 1 talks about the creation, as we all know. And in Genesis chapter 1, we find that God created what? The heavens and the earth. God created the stars, the moons, and the sun. And it says in the beginning, God had created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. Out of what? Out of nothing. Amen? Now the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering. And God said, let there be light. What else did God create? God created light. Out of nothing. There was no light. So God created it. Amen? And then, God, and then it says, and God, and God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness night. And then it goes on to say that God separated the waters from the earth, and God just created and created animals, created people, created man and woman. God created things out of everything. When we ask God to do something, we're asking the God who created the universe to do something very minute in, re in relationship to what he's already done. Because think about it. The, the earth didn't exist. The universe didn't exist. We didn't exist. And God said, God spoke it, and it happened. So when you pray and you ask God to do something, you cannot put limitations on him as if he, he was human, as if he was limited by science or technology, because science and technology are not what dictate God's ability to do something. Amen? <clears throat> Excuse me. There are many factors that might contribute to our doubting, and today I would like you three, to give you three of them as to why we feel sometimes that, that God can't do something. Number one is that we ask and we do not receive. We ask God and we do not receive. And 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 15 to 26 says, Later the Lord struck the child that Uriah the widow bore to David. Now um, Uriah the Hittite was the person that David killed. He was Bathsheba's husband. And David committed adultery with, with Bathsheba. She got pregnant and she has, a and she's, she has a baby. And David therefore pleaded with God for the child. And David fasted and went and lay all night on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him in order to help him up from the ground, but he was unwilling and would not eat food with them. Then it happened on the seventh day that the child died. In other words, God did not answer the prayer. Amen. And David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was still alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then can we tell him that the child is dead since he since he will do himself harm. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David perceived that the child was dead. So this is what David says. And he says it to his servants. Is the child dead? He asked the question, and they said, yes, he is. So David got up from the ground, washed, anointed himself, and changed his clothes, and he went into this house and worshipped the Lord. He worshipped the Lord. Amen? Then he went to his own house, and when they asked him, they served him food, and he ate. And then he went and he ministered to Bathsheba. And verse 24 said, Then David comforted his wife, Bathsheba, and he went and they, and, and they had another son and they named him Solomon. Here's a good example of somebody asking for something, praying, fasting, laying before the Lord. He's not even talking to anybody. He's pushing everybody away. It's just him and God. He is intimately, he's intimately involved with God, just asking the Lord to give him this one miracle to please don't let his son die. And when the, the Lord does not answer his prayer, what does David do? Does he, go, does he go and throw a fit? Does he get mad at God? It says, no, David went and worshipped the Lord. Why? Because David understood. David understood, first of all, that there were consequences to his actions. This is probably one of them. And David also understood that if God wanted to, God would have healed him. And it was God's choice not to. So David accepted it because it was God's decision. And David worshipped God for the decision that he made in not answering that prayer. And that's the attitude that we have to learn to have. That it's okay to ask God for something, but if we don't receive it, then we should find out what is wrong with our relationship with God that makes us get mad at him because what we're saying is that we don't accept his answer. If God doesn't give us this thing, then we're going to get mad at him. If God doesn't do that for me, then I'm going to, you know how many days I've been praying, how many years I've been praying, how, many, how much I've been fasting, and God doesn't answer this prayer for me, but it's God's decision to answer it or not. 
And we as humans tend to get emotional and tend to get angry at a God who basically knows what he wants for us. And, and God wants to help us. God wants to do what's best for us. Many times we ask God for something and he, choo he simply chooses not to do it. David demonstrated that even though God did not heal his son, that he would still comfort his wife and acknowledge that he would see his son again in eternal life. And David says at the end of the scriptures that I will see him again. Him and I will come together again. So David knew that the great reward was, yes, my blessing, my, my prayer was not answered here on earth, but I will once again see my son in heaven. Amen. And if you're praying for someone and, you're, and, and that God is not answering that prayer for you, just keep praying. Keep asking the Lord and God will come through whether here or there. And God will bring peace to the situation once you embrace the fact that God is in control. Number two is that we ask and it takes a long time for the prayer to be answered. And that's, that's one that I have difficulty with because you want something like right away. We want microwave results, right? We can't put the pot on the, on the stove because it takes too long to boil. So we throw it in the microwave for four minutes and it's ready to go. Psalms chapter 90 verse 4 says, For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passed by, or like a watch in the night. This is, this is one reason why people doubt God. We tend to hold God to an earthly clock. Remember, God is tenseless. In other words, he's not present, past, present, or future. And God is timeless. He does not operate on the standard clock like we do. There is no time zone in heaven. It's not Eastern time or, or Central time or Standard time. There is no time zone to, to be judged by. It's always the same time. That is why it might seem so long for a prayer to get answered. God quote, GodQuestions.com says it this way. We live in a physical world with its four known space-time dimensions of length, width, height, depth, or time. However, God dwells in a different realm, realm, the spirit realm, beyond the perception of our physical senses. It is not that God isn't real. It's a matter of, of his not being limited to the physical laws of dimensions that govern our world. Therefore, when you ask God for something and he answers to him, it's instant. It could have been five years for you, but to him it was an immediate response. To us it feels like forever. But in the forever time it takes God to answer, his mercy allows us to change, and his mercy allows our hearts to actually um, and develop and encourage faith. So he, he, he makes us wait in our earthly clock, because in that waiting period, there's a process that we go through that actually helps us in the long run. Because that process of waiting, when we're very impatient as humans, we like things right away, that process of waiting actually develops character, it develops faith, it develops trust, all of which, and it develops hope, all of which we would be, ab we would be unable to live a Christian life without. So it is impossible to live a Christian life without faith. It's impossible to live without hope. It's impossible to live a sustained life in Christianity without trusting. And all of this period of waiting, God is working and working and working, working out that patience in us, working in something out in us. And finally, when he gives us the answer, we've developed this, this entirely new way of thinking, this entirely new faith, and we say, my goodness, thank the Lord he didn't give it to me when I asked for it. And how many of you have experienced something like that, where you've asked for something, you've waited a long time, and you realize that because you were waiting, it was better than when he gave it to you right away? It's like almost like when you work very hard for something, and you say, my goodness, I worked 25 years to buy this thing, and you get it, you appreciate it more, amen, than when if you can just get up and buy it right away. So that's basically what, one of the things that I believe happens, is that because we waited so long, that we have more appreciation for what he's, giving it, for what he's given us. The third one is that we ask God with improper motives, selfishness, greed, pride. Luke 22, verse 39 through 42 says, And he came out and went as it was his habit to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And this is during the last week before Jesus was crucified. Now when he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you do not come into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw away, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father... If you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but thine be done. And what he was talking about was the fact that he had to go to the cross and be crucified. Not the physical pain he was going to endure that day. Maybe some of that was part of his motivation. But what he was saying was, man, the weight of the sin of the world is too much for me to bear. 
and I can't do this. But, however, if this is what you want me to do, Dad, then I'm going to do it. Because not my will, but your will. And he, did, he basically got a no from God. He basically was asking for something that was going to benefit him because he did not want to go through what he had to go through. In the flesh, he did not want to go through that. But he also understood that when he asked God for something, that it had to be a God-motivated reason for asking. And this was a God-motivated reason. He didn't want to go through the pain. But he also knew that the reason why he had left heaven and come to earth was so that he could make it to the cross. And avoiding the cross would have then made it a failure, him leaving heaven and coming down to be with us. And you can see the emotion that he puts into it. He says, take this away from me, Father. I don't want to suffer this, but not my will, but yours. And when we pray, very rarely do we say, God, I don't care how it feels, just give it to me. Just give me what I want, God. I don't care what the consequences are to those around me. I don't care what the consequences are to my family, to my friends, to the people around me, to my neighbors. I just want to feel and get what you have for me, and this is what I want. And it's the contrary to how Jesus prayed it when he says, not my will, but done. And when we ask, we should be saying, Lord, if this is part of your will for my life, then please give it to me. If it's not part of your will for my life, then don't let it happen. Then close the door because I would rather suffer the consequences of not getting it than, than, than enjoy the delights of having it and then suffering later on for something that, that could have actually stolen heaven from me. Too many times our prayers are self-centered. What I mean by this is that people ask God for a raise, yet they don't tithe. Did I say that? I did say that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You want to get a raise, but you're not tithing, so it's self-centered. You just want money for you. They ask God for a child, but they won't bring the child to church and raise them up in the fear of God. I see that many times. They pray, they pray, they pray, Lord, give me a child. They get the child, and they never show up at church with the child. Now, their, their duty is to, to do like Hannah did. I think it was Hannah who surrendered her child to the Lord. And, and, and that was the sacrifice. I mean, she made the ultimate sacrifice. She got the kid that she never had. She was a barren woman. And when God gives him to her, what does she do? She sacrifices him to the Lord and gives him to the service of God. When we ask for something, so many times we want to consume that thing for ourselves. We don't want to share it with others. They ask God for a car, but they won't give somebody a ride to the doctor. Or even worse, they spend more time washing the car and caring for the car than they do reading God's word. And this is the way it is, folks. This is the way secular society has trained us to be, that we buy things, we worship them, and we, they become such an idol in our lives that we spend less time with God. Amen? Less and less time with God. We ask for something and make the idol, make the thing an idol that was supposed to be a blessing to us. Yes, you need a car to go to work, and yes, on Long Island especially, we all need cars. But when you get that car, think about what, what kind of ministry you can do with that car. How can you be a blessing to others? Because the car isn't yours to begin with. God is lending it to you. Amen? And God wants you to be resourceful with it. So in an effort, so God in an effort to help us not become distracted and make demigods out of the blessing, he chooses in some cases to not give us what will hurt us. An example can be that video game that a child has. Amen? He no longer wants to come out of his room and spend time with the family because he's consumed by the video game. And if any of you have kids with video games, you know what I'm talking about. And let's not talk about the provisions that you're asking God to let you buy the latest iPhone 13 Pro or the Galaxy Note 20 so that you can spend the entire time over dinner while you're supposed to be talking to your wife or with your family, interacting with the phone instead of the family. You pray for things. We pray for things that then become distractions and do not become utilities to the advancement of the kingdom of God. So what are we saying with all of this? That our motives for asking need to change that we need to ask the Lord to help us align the motive for the things that we're praying for. My question today is, what are you praying for? Does it seem like God is taking forever? Are you asking for something that will bring glory to God? Maybe you're tired of asking and waiting, and maybe you've given up praying today because God has not answered you. But I want to encourage all of us here today. I want to encourage you to not give up praying for something that lines up with the Word of God. And one of those examples could be the way we're praying for Pastor Al to get healed. The way we're praying on Wednesday nights for all the list of people that we do pray for that are sick, the missionaries, the families that are hurting, um, the fires that have happened. I mean, I, there's such a list of things that we pray for on Wednesdays, it's impossible to name them all here. But we pray believing because these are things that line up with the Word of God. These are things that will bring glory to God. So we pray and we fast for them and we believe God for them. And just because we don't get a prayer, I mean, we could have stopped praying for Pastor Al two weeks ago when he was in Jersey. 
We could have stopped praying for him then and said, oh, he's home. There's no more reason to pray for him. But no, we kept praying. We kept praying and we kept believing for the Lord to heal Pastor Al and to get him off of the ventilator, uh, off of the machine that he was on. And that's what God is doing. And it is godly. It is okay for us to pray for Pastor Al to continue to get healed. It is also okay for us to pray for people that are sick, that might have cancer, that might have heart disease, that might have any uh, drug addicts. People stop praying for them. There's no hope, they say. There's no cure for many things in this world. But I've seen God do many things that are incurable. Because God is the God of miracles. We've got to stop play, placing human limitations on things that are not human to begin with. God is a God of the impossible. He is the God of the impossible. That impossible thing that you see, that whatever it is that you see as an impossibility in your life, well, that's who God is. We cannot place earthly restrictions on an eternal God. We cannot place earthly restrictions on an eternal God. We've got to stop thinking outside of the way we think as we're earthlings, because we're only earthlings temporarily. We're truly heaven people, and we're just passing through this joint, trying to get somewhere and doing the best that we can. And while we're here, we're going to grab somebody with us and bring them along for the ride when we get to heaven. That's what we're supposed to be doing, but we get trapped and we get brainwashed by society that we start thinking that the doctor gave me a report and the doctor says, oh, it's over. You're never going to get over this thing. Well, that's a lie. Or that could be a lie. You continue to pray. If it's God's will, he will do that. He will. But what says that we shouldn't pray? What says that we shouldn't pray is that you give up praying then. Then where is the faith in that? Then how do we, how do we get over that? I've been going through a season in my life where people that are close to me are going through trials and sicknesses. And I have to confess, many times I have doubted. I've even stopped praying and I've questioned God over these things. And God has convicted me. God has said, you have to keep praying. And God, this week, this whole word came about by a devotion that I did this week that we do on this app that Sister Lori puts out. And I, and I, and I, jo I joined back in on Thursday because I was at Camp Champion. And I had another word, Pastor Peter, and you know it was David and Uriah. We'll preach it another time maybe. <laughs> right? And then and, and Thursday, this is the scripture the Lord gave. He just gave me that scripture, and out of that scripture, he gave me the title yesterday morning, and that's how this whole thing evolved. God wants us to know that he can do anything we ask him for. Amen? That's, that's the word today, folks. God wants all of us to know that he can do anything we ask him for and that we need to stop placing earthly limitations on an omnipotent God. And this is the season that I've been going through, like I'm saying, I doubt. I, I fast, I pray, and I, I don't see anything happening. But guess what? I need to continue to press in. Okay, so then I'll increase my fasting. Let's see what happens then. And guess what? It's, it's, it, the answers haven't come, but, but, the, but the Lord is doing a work in me that's different than the answer. And had the answer come, maybe I would have stopped fasting, and maybe I would have stopped praying. But the fact that the answer hasn't come yet, I'm still on my knees seeking these things. And God has got me through a process. I won't give back the pain that it hurts that, that, that we go through sometimes or that I've been through in exchange for an immediate response because I know, I know that God loves me so much that even though it hurts me, he still has his best interest in it for me. It's like a child. You tell him you can't play anymore. The child screams and kicks. He thinks the world is going to end. And you don't give up that game, do you? You say, no, son, you've got to do this. And you know that it hurts you. It hurts you more than it hurts the child because you see your child crying. How many know what I'm talking about? It used to hurt me like heck, you know, just to discipline the child. Sometimes it hurts. But we also know what the consequences for, could be for not bringing that discipline to the child. We also know that letting him have his way whenever he wanted to is also going to spoil the child and not, ter not help him be the person that God wants him to be. We serve a great God, folks. We serve a powerful God. There are over 200 miracles recorded in the Bible, and I could refer to them all. And today, if you are doubting that God can do something, I encourage you to study and find out what these miracles were. Find out what were the impossible things that God did in the Bible. The walls of Jericho coming down, the miracles at the well, the miracles of healing, the miracle of, of crossing the Red Sea, the miracle of feeding the, Egypt, the, the Israelites in the desert, manna from heaven. I mean, think about it, quail. Birds came from the sky and just dropped every day for them to eat. Stuff came up from the ground and they ate every day. Water when the rock gets hit in the desert. I mean, think about it. A rock, a, pure, a simple rock, you hit it and, and water comes out. 
I mean, where, where has anybody ever seen anything like that? A person's arm gets healed. A person's leg gets healed. Somebody who's never walked. Somebody who's never seen. Somebody, I mean, I can go, I, I see it every day. People who are on drugs, their parents say he's never going to change. He's going to die. People who have overdosed and come back to life. God does these things. It's a, he's a God of the impossible. People that have been healed of cancer. People that have been healed of heart disease. People that have been healed of whatever you want to call it. It's the God that we serve. Stand with me. We serve an impossible God. Because our impossible God is an eternal God. And God wants to encourage every single one of us here today that are praying or going through something. God wants you to know, guys, that, listen, you might have been praying and you might still be praying for this thing for a long time. He wants you to continue to pray. Another one is, you might have been praying for something and that God didn't give you that answer. Maybe you were praying for somebody not to pass away and they passed away anyway, and now you're mad at God for whatever reason. I encourage you to seek the Lord, amen, seek the Lord and ask the Lord to heal you in that area because God knows best. And John, I'm going to use you as an example one more time. John's wife was sick a few, um, two years ago, one year ago, John, yes. And she went to the hospital and they told her she had three weeks to live. And John called me. And I said, it's impossible. That, that could never happen. We're going to pray. I said, it's impossible that, they, that they're going to get this thing right, three weeks to live. And, and God decided to take his wife home. And a year ago, John called me and said, hey, my wife went home to be with the Lord. And there's been a process for John in his life. And that's not why I asked you to come here today, John. I wasn't planning on using you as a, as a prop. But I'm using you as a testimony of someone who's embraced God's decision, even though it hurts. Amen? Even though it hurts. Even though you might have lost your son, even though you might have lost your daughter, even though you have a family member who's on drugs, even though you have a relative who's not saved, even though somebody's hurting you at work and you keep praying and, they're not, and, and God doesn't answer that prayer, I'm, I'm telling you, God knows. God listens. God hears. God cares more than you could ever imagine. And I encourage us today to not give up praying. Don't give up asking. Don't give up seeking. Remember, we serve a God. We serve a God. We serve a God of the impossible. Amen. There is nothing too complicated for God. Absolutely nothing. That's my word for us today. Would you bow your heads with me, please, as the worship team comes up? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, doubt and fear, the Bible says, are not of the Lord. And we'll start by repenting for doubting and fearing. Father, today we ask for forgiveness for doubting, for the times that we've asked you, Lord, to, to do something in our lives, and, and we've placed earthly limitations on your capabilities, Lord. And today, Father God, we ask that you would renew our faith. Lord, that you would strengthen us. Father, that you would help us through this journey. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would give us the faith needed, Father God, to continue our earthly life. That you would help us not to become discouraged when we ask and we don't receive. That you would help us, Father God, to be patient when you don't answer our prayers. And that you would help us, Lord God, to ask for things that are not selfish. Hallelujah, Father, we praise you because you're a merciful God. We praise you because you're the God of the universe. You're the God who formed us in our mother's womb. You're, you intricately made us and, and you know every part of our being. And Father, today I lift up the brokenhearted and the hurting people that are praying today that have not gotten that answer, Lord God, I pray that the process in their life would come to completion, Lord, and that you would bring them the answer that they're seeking, that you would bring all of us the answer that we have for the prayers that we place before you every day, Lord. We praise your name. We thank you, Lord, because you are God, and we thank you, Jesus, because you hear and care about our cry. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.
waiting for change to still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never failed me This is my confidence. 